Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here together with Vittoria and Phil, and we are going to discuss today about Stonewall. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Christian, and I'm the Global Lead for Private Nurse. Uh, Vittoria and Phil will introduce themselves. Absolutely. My name is Vittoria Pissarro. I am one of the regional leads for the NAM Pride Network, and um, I'm very excited to be here today to talk about Stonewall and see what else that we can we can create. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Victoria. My name is Phil Vacchio. I am the chair for the NAM Pride Network here in the U.S., and we all roll up into the Global Pride at MERS team as well. So also very excited to be here today. Let's get right into it. Now, you two being in the U.S., you have more context of this than I do. Um, so, Victoria, can you explain to me first um, what Stonewall? Tell me about it. So Stonewall Inn is a very famous gay bar now because of the Stonewall Rebellion. It is in New York in Greenwich Village. Um, going back to 1969, this was one of the more popular gay bars at the time. Uh, you have to remember back in the 60s, it was still very much illegal to engage in any kind of quote unquote gay activity, holding hands with somebody, hugging, dancing with somebody of the same sex. So a lot of members of the community went to these gay bars um, to have a place, you know, to feel safe, to feel home and, and to celebrate. What I found was really interesting is um, a lot of the gay bars were actually owned by the mafia. The mafia realized that they could capitalize off of the community's pain. So they bought these bars up, they did very minimal renovations, and then they reopened them and they ended up blackmailing the patrons that went to the bar to ensure that they would come back. On top of it, the mafia also made hush payments to the police so that way they knew when those bars were going to be raided. Moving forward to the actual event, which took place on June 28th, 1969, that night was very different than most nights at the bar because the mafia didn't make that payment to the police. They had no idea that they were going to be raided. And when the police showed up, they had a bar full of patrons, and that's when things really started to get a little chaotic. The police started arresting people, throwing people out of the bar. They started getting really, really violent, and that's where everybody now knows this as the Stonewall Riots, um, but that's where the Stonewall Rebellion really started. Um, it's important to note that the term riots was used by the police to justify their violence towards the members of the community, whereas the members of the community and onlookers that were there used the term rebellion because they were fighting back for their basic rights. Another important thing to note about the Stonewall Rebellion is that um, drag queens and transgender people of color were the first people to really push back at the police. Um, once the violence started, they started throwing rocks, um, even pennies at the police to try and get them to stop. One of the names I've often heard in the whole Stonewall discussion is, is Marsha Johnson, uh, yes. who was one of the drag queens who was uh, a very proud activist, a very outspoken, and wouldn't, Stonewall wouldn't have had such a huge impact without the, the strong characters who are pushing through um, the reforms and all the gay rights discussion. Is there any other like um, any other famous or like a uh, person that we should know? So Sylvia Rivera was also um, at the Stonewall riots. Uh, Sylvia was a Latina American drag queen who later came out um, as transgender and was a very radical um, gay and transgender activists during the 1960s and the 1970s. Together with Marsha P. Johnson, um, they co-founded the Gay Liberation Front and STAR. For those of you who don't know, STAR is the Street Transgender Action Revolutionaries Group, um, and it was committed to helping homeless transgender youth in New York City at the time. It's so interesting that all of this is uh, uh, the couple of names that we just mentioned. It's interesting that they are part of the LGBTQ community, but they are also person of colors. That they are the people really fighting for, like, in the forefront of the fight for uh, gay rights. Definitely. Yep. But now let's think about it. Let's move a little bit on after that. 1969 is 50 more than 50 years in the past. Phil, what has happened right. in the U.S. since then? So 
I, I really think the Stonewall Uprising led to significant progress in LGBTQ plus rights, right? And it's not, it's, it's, there's definitely a lot more that, that needs to be done, but I don't want to diminish that progress that has happened, right? So I think in, in terms of progress on rights, visibility, and acceptance in the United States, we really moved forward after that uprising. So I know some things that, that really come to mind are how states began to repeal legislation, which criminalized same sex relationships. Um, you saw on federal, state, and local levels, there were several laws enacted that protected LGBTQ plus individuals from discrimination in housing, employment, and, and other areas in general, right? Um, I think the most well-known, right, would obviously be the Marriage Equality Act of 2015. Um, obviously, there were states that legalized marriage prior to that, but on a federal level um, in 2015, that's really where the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage nationwide. Um, there is so much more progress that has been made from 1969 onward, and I know I really only spoke on a few, right? But I think what's most telling is that the public opinion toward LGBTQ plus individuals has shifted significantly with, with growing acceptance and support. And I can only hope that this acceptance continues to move forward in the years to come. And that, that applied not only for the US, right? Because I know that uh, I live in Copenhagen and I see a lot of people celebrating Stonewall as a land, as a, as like a monumental land. day, right? Yes, monumental day for LGBTQ community globally. So we, it sparked a huge pink wave. I know in 1971, it started with like Australia, Austria, Costa Rica, Finland, and it comes all over the world. And until, until now, it's still, uh, a monumental day. And in 1989, in the UK, there's even a charity organization named after Stonewall. Mm. Um, one year after they have this section 28 that bans promotion of homosexuality by schools and councils across Britain, which led to a total suppression of LGBTQ identities in school. So it is an important landmark. It's an important day for everyone, not just the United States. And yep. out of that, right, what do you two think is the biggest fight today in inclusion? As you said, things have progressed so far. So yep. what's the fight now? Um, there's so much that, that comes to mind. I think that, that really the fight for transgender rights remains that main focus, that significant focus, right? I think there's so many efforts here in people trying to secure access to healthcare, ending discrimination in employment, housing, and just in general, um, just uh, there's so much more. I'm conversion therapy bans. I mean, this is probably a global issue as well, but there's a lot of groups and activists that are working to ban conversion therapy across the country. Victoria, I mean, what comes to your mind? I know that I touched on a few. I'm sure you can echo some of that as well. Absolutely. You definitely touched upon transgender rights, which for me is extremely important to talk about. One of the other tidbits to kind of bounce off of that as well is reproductive rights here in the U.S. is actually impacting transgender health care um, and mm -hmm. access for the proper health care for uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, many people don't realize how that's all connected and it's really important that to keep that in the back of your mind when you're looking at different bills and things that are getting passed um, and companies too when they're you know picking out what kind of health care options they're going to be offering to their employees that's something that they can be looking at and making sure that they're offering things like that making sure that they're looking into different things like parental leave that is geared more toward LGBTQ plus couples and not just heterosexual couples. I think that's also extremely important. Um, I mean, we could be here all day, Phil, going over all of these things. I know yeah, it's, it's it's extremely important to the both of us. And while Victoria makes some great points and while there has been progress made from an acceptance standpoint, I think it's also important to note that there are still countries in this world where it's even difficult to have a conversation like this, to have a civil conversation around this topic. There are areas of the world where members of the LGBTQ community live under specific laws that actually criminalize them with repercussions ranging from imprisonment to death. And even more recently, globally, and even here in the US, we're seeing that legislation being passed that has even further limited the expression of transgender people. So there is definitely more progress that needs to be made. 
So now you already touched upon the upon it, Victoria. Like, but how can companies help? We work in a company with more than a hundred thousand people in more than mm -hmm. one hundred thirty countries globally. Mm -hmm. We have an impact even just internally. So what's what can companies do? Well, on on top of what we already talked about, I know one of the other things that companies can do potentially is looking into relocation assistance for some of their employees. Like you just said, Phil, there are a lot of places in the world where you can be criminalized just for being yourself. It's illegal to to love who you who you love. And, you know, that can be very scary for certain individuals. Um, you know, we have these travel policies that the company has to try and keep us safe. You know, when we do have to travel to locations that aren't as accepting. Um, for who we are, but maybe looking into some sort of relocation assistance for, you know, employees that are living in places where they no longer feel safe and they no longer feel comfortable. Yeah, and I think on top of that, um, I mean, you can see us here, right? We're, we're part of these employee resource networks, and I think it's it's one of the most simple things, right, that, that companies can begin to do to support um the lgbtq community so companies supporting um the formation and the activities of these employee resource networks that are really focused on lgbtq issues i think would go a long way you know these these networks really provide a platform for networking support and advocacy within the company um, and it can help shape those policies and initiatives that victoria just spoke about right so outside of that i think companies can also publicly you know announce their support for the lgbtq plus community and advocate for that equity and equality across the board so whether it's corporate statements sponsorships you know participating in these external events i think just just ultimately promoting that diversity equity and inclusion will really keep your employees engaged that are part of that community and also attract the right talent for the company that really aligns with those values and having those uh, that I really like that, like the and having those events does not mean the company is undermining other viewpoints, right? No, if you definitely don't, not. If not someone, at all. If someone doesn't agree with like, you know, how pride is conducted or how, um, you know, we shouldn't be talking about it, then they can just stay away and not do not be part of the discussion. But mm -hmm. they need to still respect their coworker as human beings in the office, right? Um, and also, I, I remember when I when we started the discussion on having a pride at Maris globally here, like I, it was very clear that when we asked the executive sponsor, right, um, Mr. And Miss our executive sponsor, we need help. We want to establish this. Please, uh, we need one money. We need to activism. We need you to advocate for us in the leadership team. So it was a very interesting, and we've now have it for one and a half years. It's been an interesting journey. Yeah. For sure, and we can also have more like what you uh, you kind of like touch a little bit like having those resources for people, whether it's the like our relocation policy if they're not at a safe place. Um, mm -hmm. also to have resources for people in the different diversity groups, cause and having things that match them. For example, a resource for LGBTQ parents and such. Absolutely. And right. just even having the ability to have these conversations, I think, is just really important. And it really just sets the bar for allyship as well. You don't have to be part of this community to support the community and the members that are in it. You don't have to know every single thing in order to be supportive. You can be there to learn as well and make sure that you're standing up and speaking out when needed. Yeah, and I, I honestly just think it's it really comes down to companies ensuring that everyone is welcome, right? That you're promoting this inclusive environment, that exclusion is not an option. I, I think that's really how companies can take this into the right direction. Oh my God, Phil, when you said that, I remember uh, we just had this conversation via email with our chief DEI, right? That we live up yes. to our values and that means everyone is welcome at MERS. 100%. And we will never walk away from inclusion as that will mean exclusion and that is not an option for MERS. Definitely. And that is powerful that we need to keep on reiterating that. Right, just treat people with respect. It's, it's really all we ask, <laughs> honestly. Absolutely. So that's on a company level where they are, it's a much bigger organization, it's a much bigger organism, but for all our listeners and you and us in here, um, how can individuals help? What would you say? 
I would definitely say fostering an inclusive environment, kind of going back to what I just said, you don't have to be a member of the community to support the community. You don't have to be educated on every single thing in order to foster that environment. Just being able to be open and saying, I don't know this, I'm going to learn, I'm going to educate myself is a huge step. Um, you could also do something as simple as you know, having your pronouns out there that would create a inclusive environment for all of those around you and show other colleagues, other people that you are around that you are a safe place. You know, it, it, it just shows that you are there to listen. You're there to respect that person and you are not going to judge them. What do you think, Phil? One thing that comes to mind is that I think it's important for people to really take the initiative to educate themselves about LGBTQ plus identities, experiences, and issues. You know, that can be done by reading books, articles, and if reading really isn't your thing, then there are some great documentaries and films out there that can also provide those insights into LGBTQ plus history, struggles, and achievements. Um, and I really think that by doing this, people will be informed and, and have that ability to challenge any misconceptions that are brought about within any conversation, whether it be at work or in your personal life. Um, but with any kind of marginalized community in general, I, I really think that by listening to firsthand accounts and learning through those lived experiences makes all the difference. You catch their words right out of my mouth. I was just about to say we like as individuals, we need to be involved, like uh, see if you can find like a human rights organization or a nonprofit that focuses on LGBT rights in your areas. Um, volunteer when needed, uh, be an ally, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, yeah, learn and apply it. Don't be uh, yeah. don't be afraid. There's no um, there's no right or wrong it's a journey that it's a journey that everyone's on so first step's the most important step very good point absolutely and we have run out of time right now unfortunately thank you so much for listening in thank you so much victoria and philip for joining me in this uh, delightful conversation and yeah looking forward to our next pride at Merce podcast thank you christian i appreciate it thank you for having us